Welcome to Dialogue. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, and in today's show, we will continue our discussion regarding the U.S. Taliban peace talks and whether or not we are going to be seeing a revival of those talks and the aftermath of President Donald Trump's announcement, particularly his announcement regarding a ceasefire that is expected to come from the Taliban, which has bewildered not just the U.S. administration, but also the Taliban and the Afghan government, who have pointed out that perhaps the possibility of a ceasefire is not as strong as as uh, Mr. Donald Trump's announcement has uh, shown or displayed. So we'll talk about whether or not we're going to see any of that uh, in the coming days and whether or not Taliban's stance of beginning from where they left off back in September and the possibility of an inter-Afghan dialogue is on, uh, uh, is on the table or not and what exactly does the US side mean when they're talking about a ceasefire. We'll also be taking a look at the situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir as we know, of course, uh, when the situation changed by India's unilateral moves on the 5th of August 2019, uh, the people of occupied Kashmir continue to suffer even more than they did previously. And they have been doing that uh, on the 118th consecutive day today. And we'll see how long we're going to see this number rise and what is uh, the next step forward to actually making a change in the lives of the Kashmiri people. And if this continues, what are the repercussions both for Kashmir and then, of course, relations between India and Pakistan? To talk more about these topics, we have been joined in the studios uh, with our respected guests. I'd like to first introduce uh, senior journalist Mr. Javed Sadiq. Thank you for joining us, sir. We've also been joined by foreign affairs expert Dr. Amna Memo. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us. And we've also been joined by senior analyst, brigadier retired Mr. Deepu Sultan. Thank you, sir, for being with us today. First of all, we'll talk about the situation in Afghanistan and uh, the possibility of a revival of uh, U.S. Taliban peace talks. We know that um, the prisoner swap that we've seen uh, recently pointed towards a positive sign of um, a resumption of negotiations on the table. And then President Donald Trump's announcement seemed to uh, fairly put forward this on the table that there is a likelihood that this is going to happen. However, now we see that his statements regarding the ceasefire are not going down that well or not supported by uh, statements coming in from the Taliban side. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think in the last one year, we have witnessed a uh, progress on uh, U.S. Taliban talks and uh, finally President Trump has announced uh, that he is going to withdraw the U.S. troops from Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, and this is uh, an important announcement and we have seen rounds of talks taking place between Taliban and the U.S. Uh, representatives uh, in Doha, in Pakistan <laughs> and in many other countries. So the progress has been made. But then these talks are stalled by violations on both sides. You right. know, both sides, U.S. and Taliban, they accuse each other of violating the terms and conditions which were reached or which have, which have been reached by the two sides on the table. Right. So that's why these talks are stalled from time to time. But uh, the positive thing is that the U.S. president has announced uh, in categorical terms uh, that uh, the, the ceasefire uh, will take place between U.S. and Taliban. And he has expressed his optimism about a positive development on the U.S.-Taliban talks. So he's hopeful uh, that they will reach an agreement with Taliban. And if the U.S. Uh, does that, I mean, if U.S. carries out the promises that it has made to Taliban on the negotiation table, I hope uh, that uh, the positive outcome will be there. Uh, also, you know, the next year is the presidential election in the United States, and the U.S. President, Mr. Donald Trump, has committed to the American people and the world at large that he wants an end to hostilities in, right. in Afghanistan. He wants to put an end to this war, uh, almost uh, two decades old war. And he wants to bring peace and a negotiated settlement to Afghanistan. And hopefully that uh, the president before the next election uh, will take concrete steps and will uh, carry out the promises that it has made to Taliban and a negotiated settlement will be reached in Afghanistan. Right, but when we see statements coming in, especially from the Taliban side, we say that they are um, firm on the stance that they're just going to pick up 
from where they left off in September and that there's no change in uh, the way they're going to put forward the negotiations. And the ceasefire that uh, Mr. Trump is pointing towards seems to point towards a change in which he particularly mentioned that initially the Taliban did not want a ceasefire, now they want a ceasefire and probably that's going to work. It's going to work out that way is uh, what he said more or less. Um, but the Taliban seems to be denying that. So um, who are we to believe? <laughs> You know, uh, there is a trust deficit between two parties. Uh, and uh, as un uh, U.S. unilaterally called off uh, the peace talks previous uh, round, and uh, Taliban just uh, condemned that and they were not ready to. But it was just on one instance. Uh, I think that at that time, peace process should be continued instead of uh, violating the terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think that uh, Taliban are not going to come on negotiation table so easily. They would uh, certainly resist, and um, uh, it is their style. You know, they they want to have their own terms and conditions for the talk. Secondly, you have seen that uh, President Ghani he wanted to take the charge of these negotiation process, right. and he wanted to transfer it from Qatar to Kabul. And that is also not acceptable for the Taliban. You know, they are not taking Ashraf Ghani as the legitimate, uh, legitimate party to uh, negotiate. Yes, and they've on. always said that. Yeah, obviously. And they, at the same time, uh, you see that they are distrustful towards Pakistan. And he referred towards Pakistan's and, uh, again, entire terrorism and terrorist, terrorist activities of Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Though Pakistan has arranged everything, we, are, we have fenced and... Uh, we have tried to stop all sort of infiltration on the border. Despite that, uh, Afghanistan is continuing. At one time, they say that Pakistan should use its leverage on Taliban to bring on uh, to bring them on negotiation table, and on the other hand, they continue to accuse Pakistan. Right. So it means that uh, problem of distrust is prevailing yet. So um, there are possibilities that uh, Taliban will come on the negotiation table, but certainly they would be firm on their demands as they Right, because the Taliban, in effect, have always said that they want to have a negotiation yes. with the U.S. and they're ready to talk to the U.S. as the U.S. who backed out And you uh, see, they have September. shown a lot of flux... Um, uh, you know, flexibility on the on the topic because previously they were not ready to have any talk with the U.S. Uh, until they withdraw from here. Right. But they, they are negotiating for the last two years and it's right. not long. Right. And since September they have said that they are they are still open to dialogue with the U.S. but they are firm on their stance and that yeah. seems to not change right now. So when we see Mr. Donald Trump's uh, statement, uh, sir, we see that um, uh, he's pointing towards a change in the Taliban stance that they might be um, open towards a ceasefire or open towards something which were, they were not uh, pre-September when the uh, talks actually collapsed. Um, is that a new development which Mr. Donald Trump is pointing towards because the Taliban side seems to be claiming that nothing has changed on that stance? I think the Americans can have their wishes uh, list, but the fact is that uh, the, 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 the two year, 20 years old uh, conflict has proved one thing that the Taliban are staying as a political and military power mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. And the real issue is, the real issue is how the Taliban and uh, the government in Kabul come to terms with each other, mm -hmm. which is called the intra-Afghan dialogue. Right. The strength of Taliban is their capability of militancy. The, the West has tried the democracy. There have been various elections in Afghanistan. The latest election has also you know, not been that successful. And when uh, the U.S. president just visited Afghanistan, he shook hands with uh, Ashraf Ghani, all right, was telling Abdullah Abdullah that he is their man. But the point is, can he deliver what the U.S. wants out of Taliban or not? I think the Taliban strategy is that they can wait for a very long time. That is, that is a Pashtun inbuilt strategy. And uh, they waited for a long time. They know that uh, the time is on their side, the time is not on the American side. Exactly. So they have no impetus to stop fighting. No, the point is that even if they, you know, tacitly agree that they will, they will adhere to a ceasefire, um, it will only be temporary. Okay. I think the U.S. is in a hurry to get out, and the moment they get out, this truce will uh, go okay. out of the window. Uh, I'm absolutely very sure about that.
Okay. Because the Taliban um, just do not believe in democracy as yet, although the spokesman has said that the Taliban are not looking to govern Afghanistan all by themselves, like they did in the, tried in, in, the, in the 90s, 1990s. But uh, at the same time, I think the Taliban will always uh, talk and negotiate from a position of strength when the U.S. leaves. The U.S. is there. Uh, it is a factor. It is a stakeholder, all right. But I think uh, as the time passes, the American cause will progressively keep getting weaker because Donald Trump wants to get out. There are elections uh, coming up in the uh, in the in America next mm -hmm. year, and he has promised something. Is also very weakened because of his case from uh, Ukraine. Of, uh, there is an impeachment inquiry going on over there. And he wants, he, he came to Afghanistan with a purpose, you know, to assert as, a, as an American president and to fulfill his promises, what he did in, in the Middle East, he has withdrawn his forces from Syria, now he wants to withdraw from Afghanistan, but there is a jigsaw puzzle in Afghanistan, right. like it was. I mean, the, the, the courts accused, accused the Americans of leaving them high and dry. Right, and the, but the, the, the even though, uh, no matter how important this visit has been uh, termed and it, it has been termed important well, as visit, Ashraf Ghani also but it, they're still saying it doesn't mean that there is going to be a resumption of talks not uh, permanently uh, or well, accurately. Well from the optics uh, point of view for the Americans this visit uh, can be very important whether okay. mostly the across the turf of America the American public uh, in general does not understand the strategy in South Asia and uh, for them, the, the, the pictures and the optics that he's visited Afghanistan and shook hands with Ashraf Ghani and wants to withdraw his forces and wants to open the negotiation with Taliban is good for the American president. Practically, how it is going to play out is, is to be seen. So this move is, uh, his visit to Afghanistan is more significant for the internal politics of the Indeed. U.S. rather than towards a, 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 a progress resumption in Indeed. the U.S. And, 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 Taliban. But, it, talks. but okay. it, does, Sana, it does indicate the urgency that the Americans uh, have in their mind to get out of Afghanistan. Right. The, the that was also the, evident the, the, even the, after the collapse the, the when we had Khalilzad yeah, visiting uh, even then. The thing that they have not been able to solve is that what sort of a government they leave behind, what sort of a setup they leave behind. Right. What is going to happen to intra-Afghan dialogue? Which Who will is be in charge in Taliban? A lot important will the Taliban let them? But there is, there is one thing that I must indicate to you. What has happened in Afghanistan over the years is that uh, I think the Taliban uh, are not as popular as they used to be in the 90s. Although uh, they, they have the power of the gun all right, and they're deployed very well militarily across the turf of Afghanistan, rural areas and all that. But they, the Ashraf Ghani uh, holds a sizable population in his heart. The, the people right, but peace. even the Taliban have a lot of political uh, mileage now in Afghanistan. Won't mm -hmm. you agree, sir? They also are yeah, now I, recognized more as a political entity. The Taliban uh, have proven to the world uh, at large that they cannot be defeated on the ground. Right. And, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the beginning, when this uh, operation started in Afghanistan uh, 20 years back, uh, Operation uh, Endurance, uh, you know, the Americans were very positive and mm. very, very hopeful right. that they will be able to defeat Taliban militarily right. and they will be uh, militarily completely eliminated. Right. The but mere fact that two decades later exactly. they have to talk and to they them. And they have now mm. re realized mm. that it's not easy to defeat Taliban. The Taliban mm. have, have defeated another superpower. 20 years back, 30 years back, in 1989-90, mm -hmm. the, the Soviet Union. And now the Taliban kept fighting with the mighty uh, American military power in Afghanistan for two decades. And they have proven their resilience, their resistance, and also their, their military prowess. Mm -hmm. That they can fight for a long period of time, they have proven it. And their, their tactics, the military tactics uh, have proven to be superior to those of the Americans right. and the NATO troops. And right. finally, the U.S. and its allies have realized that there is no military solution to Afghanistan crisis. And they, they are now, they have come back to the negotiation table. <clears throat> so I think 
uh, that the Taliban's they want an appropriate time uh, for these negotiations to conclude because they want these to end at their terms and conditions. Right. And the time is on the side of Taliban because they, they don't have to lose much, but the Americans and the NATO are in a hurry right. to leave Afghanistan and at least to, uh, to leave Afghanistan with a semblance of victory. Right. And they, wanted, they want to tell the world or they want to demonstrate to the world that they have been able to achieve the objectives with which they had come to Afghanistan. A, that they have democratized Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. B, that they have brought stability to Afghanistan. And third, they wanted uh, prosperity in Afghanistan. Although these goals are still elusive, they have not been able to achieve these objectives in Afghanistan. But, you know, they are trying uh, to f do something which could uh, give them a face. I mean, for a face saving, they are doing these negotiations. Right, and because at the end of the day, to uh, uh, achieve these goals substantially, there needs to be, uh, uh, like Brigadier Saab said, an intra-Afghan dialogue or sustainable peace or um, something that they leave behind. Uh, so uh, just a U.S. peace deal um, with the Afghan Taliban will not guarantee the fulfillment of these objectives, of right? Of course, and that's why I think they, they have sought the help of, of uh, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and Pakistan has played its important role to bring these two sides, the Taliban and uh, uh, the Afghan government and the U.S. on the negotiation table. Pakistan is playing a very positive role, which has been, which has been appreciated by the Trump administration. And other players, too, want exactly. Afghanistan to be, uh, to be peaceful and stable and prosperous because instability and infight in Afghanistan will spill over to the neighboring countries and Pakistan will be the country which is going to bear the brunt of this situation. Right, and as you mentioned, there are a lot of key players involved in this conflict and um, in this peace and negotiations in Afghanistan. Uh, we've also seen recently that um, the Afghan Taliban delegation was also hosted in Iran, and uh, we've seen uh, that the foreign minister there met with the Afghan delegation. Um, even though the motives of Iran might be questioned uh, by the U.S., how do you see this playing out in the overall progress of the peace deal between the U.S. and Taliban, ma'am? I think um, Iran is a potent factor in the regional uh, peace process. Uh, you have seen that number of times uh, our uh, foreign minister visited the four capitals, including uh, Iran, Irani capital. And uh, Iran has been a major stakeholder in uh, Afghanistan due to a number of reasons. And um, they are both geostrategic and uh, geopolitical. So I think that Iran cannot be ignored, though U.S. is not very much agreed with the Iranian stance, but at the same time, Iran, the number of factions uh, struggling for power in Afghanistan, they are directly related to uh, Iran and they are being supported by Iran. So I think that uh, Iran cannot be ruled out from the peace process. Uh, but obviously, uh, Taliban uh, are having their own personal stance, reservation, resilience, and they, they, they are not ready to compromise on that. If U.S. think that uh, Iranian stance would be having some influence on uh, Taliban uh, uh, change of mind, that is not possible, I think. Uh, Taliban have their strength, as my both uh, panelists, colleagues, they mentioned that Taliban is on having an edge for a number of reasons. Right. We have discussed a number of times. Uh, and for that purpose, Taliban are going to carry their stance. And uh, I think that further uh, negotiations, one, then formation of the government and survival of the government depends on the point of view of Taliban and how it is carried by the negotiators and negotiation process. And that, will, that would be in favor of Pakistan because if a strong negotiation process would be resulted in a strong government, and uh, if there would be peace in Afghanistan, strong government can manage that only then, or that that government should be having on uh, all stakeholders on board and uh, all the local factions of Afghanistan on board, and they would be agreed on. Otherwise, you see that there would be a civil war, as previously we have seen, and that civil war is having a lot of repercussions on geopolitics and geostrategic mm -hmm. position of Pakistan and the whole region. 
so i think that uh, afghanistan uh, afghanistan's peace depends on the process of peace dialogue but uh, taliban is a potent factor that cannot be neglected in any case right and uh, when uh, the meeting was held between uh, jawad zarif and the afghan taliban delegation he also mentioned the fact that they are supporting um, uh, an intra afghan dialogue with an all inclusive government is the objective that they want and they are they are also um, motivated towards the exclusion of uh, foreign presence in afghanistan um, and it what the U.S. side has said, it seems that Iran is trying to build ties also with the Afghan government at the moment and then the Taliban, which might emerge uh, in the future as a strong political entity in Afghanistan. So when we, when we see uh, Iran's efforts in this regard, um, do you think that these efforts will be able to encourage a U.S.-Taliban dialogue at the moment or uh, the opposite? Well, the reality is that uh, Iran uh, is, uh, is a very strong country. There has been a revolution over there. And we are living very near the revolution. We don't realize how big that revolution is. Uh, they speak the same language. The country is cohesive against a potent Israeli and American threat uh, encouraged by the Saudis also. It's a very strong country. The difference now about Taliban is that they are approaching Iran themselves. They, they, they are encouraging China and the Russians. Exactly, to, they've been going around and the world. And, 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 and let me tell you that during the entire piece of negotiation, it is the Taliban who, uh, who come out better than the other stakeholders. Because the, the other stakeholders wanted to show their muscle to them, and they wanted to neglect them, and they wanted to way lead them into a, into a settlement uh, for a long period of time now, that which the Taliban have not agreed. They stood on their terms, and they even the res recent statement of the Taliban uh, the spokesman has said that they are going to start from where the, 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 the talks had ended. So I think uh, when, you, when, you, when you speak of Iran, uh, don't forget that there is a Western factor, particularly the American factor into it, there mm -hmm. is an Arab factor into it, and there is a regional factor into it. The regional factor wants the Iranians to come and play their role. Pakistan would want that, mm -hmm. Afghanistan would want that, Taliban would want that, but would the Americans want that? Mm -hmm. That is a big question. The idea is to, to, get, to the, get to peace. The idea is to get to settlement, not to mushroom the, the, the differences right. and, 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 and to fuel them. So I think uh, uh, I will again say that uh, the most important factor in the entire saga of Afghan catastrophe is intra-Afghan dialogue. Mm -hmm. How the Afghans want to settle their differences, uh, uh, this side of Arvandab River and the other side, the northern side, northwestern side of Arvandab, into Sala, across the long tunnel to mazar -e sharif to Madakshan. To, 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 Maza, to, you know, Panjshir Valley compared to Kandahar and Ghazni and Herat and all that. So, uh, you, when you see the, the demography of uh, Afghanistan and when you see the difference and when you see the type of government that is, that is there in, in Kabul and when you see Abdullah Abdullah trying to play a role which is destabilizing, in fact, Afghanistan, not helping it. Uh, I think uh, it will be prudent for Afghans, it is for them to realize, we can't tell them as, as the policy, as Pakistan's policy is that we want to leave it to the Afghan, uh, the, the people of Afghanistan, we want to encourage them all right. Uh, I, I, would, I would for once say that, uh, you know, once uh, they get the Americans and NATO out of the way, the Afghans should sit down and talk to each other and uh, have a workable government in Kabul instead of fighting because it's not, it's not going to be n in nobody's favor. And uh, I think there is, a, there, is a, there is a hope and there is an indication of change in the mind of Taliban that they want to accommodate the other factions also into it and uh, they would like uh, peace in Afghanistan. But uh, I, I, I think that uh, the Taliban want to play right now on their own terms and right, do not and even, budge an inch. Right. And even now they've been saying that this, this comes as a second step um, uh, with dialogue, with the intra-Afghan dialogue comes after uh, uh, they after have the had Americans negotiations leave. with the but U.S., right? You know, their, their stance has been, they've, they've been telling the Americans, just tell us your withdrawal schedule hmm. and leave the rest to us. Right. And uh, they want the ceasefire. 
The Taliban do not want the ceasefire. Right, but the U.S. has emphasized on the ceasefire quite a lot. But the Taliban has also talked about how uh, they're only going to have a ceasefire with the U.S. forces after a peace deal has been, uh, has been reached. And then a ceasefire uh, with the, within Afghanistan and with the Afghan government comes even after that when there is an intra-Afghan dialogue with the, and that depends on those negotiations. So they're not really agreeing to a nationwide ceasefire as Mr. Donald Trump's statement implies, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think <clears throat> the fight essentially is going on between the U.S. NATO troops and the Taliban's. The, the government in Afghanistan, in Kabul, is not a party to this fight. Uh, although they have to be a party in the final negotiated settlement of Afghanistan. But uh, for the time being, uh, the war is going on on the ground between the U.S. and the Taliban. Right. So the main agreement has to come between these two sides. Uh, I think uh, the Taliban have realized uh, that the U.S. and the NATO are also su suffering from fatigue factor mm. because they have fought this war for too long and they have not been able to achieve their basic objectives of bringing peace and stability in Afghanistan, of creating a democratic setup which is acceptable to all factions of Afghan society. So uh, a lot uh, needs to be done. Uh, the I mean, this, uh, the settlement between uh, uh, Taliban and uh, U.S. and NATO is one factor. And then a democratic dispensation of, for the future of Afghanistan is quite a task. It is hmm. going to be a very, very complex exercise because uh, Afghanistan, as we all know, is essentially a tribal society and every tribe <clears throat> and there are ethnic groups and they have their stakes, they have their own interests. So it is always very difficult to bring all those people <clears throat> on the negotiation table or to uh, bring about a reconciliation among all these factions. <clears throat> Sorry. So therefore, I think it is going to be a, a, a long task, a, a very difficult one, an arduous exercise, but hopefully when uh, the uh, government in Afghanistan, the government in Kabul, the Taliban and other people in Afghanistan, they, they, they realize that this fight and this internal strife cannot go on for a long period of time. They have suffered a lot, almost for, for 40 years, more than 40 years, Afghanistan has been in a state of crisis mm. uh, and they have suffered a lot, both materially and otherwise. So therefore, I think this is the time for all these factions to realize that their future lies in a negotiated settlement. Afghanistan's all factions, uh, Taliban, Pashtuns and non-Pashtuns, they have to be accommodated in a future government and an acceptable solution has to be found. Otherwise, it is going to be a very, very uh, a catastrophic situation. We have witnessed it and experienced it after the Soviet Union left Afghanistan, there was a civil war and there were warlords fighting with each other and Pakistan was the uh, main uh, sufferer because of this infight. Pakistan tried right. to bring, bring about uh, settlement or reconciliation among those fighting factions in Afghanistan back in 90s, but it was not achieved. So let's, not, uh, let's hope that it doesn't repeat itself. Right. I mean, the civil war doesn't happen in Afghanistan again because that is going to affect Pakistan also in a very adverse fashion. Okay, last question, ma'am, on uh, the issue of Afghanistan. There's also a, a, a seemingly uh, a contradiction uh, between the stance by the U.S. administration and uh, President Donald Trump, where the president has announced a, a, a ceasefire, but the administration said that what we're going to look for is a reduction in violence. Which of the two would seem likely in terms of a resumption of the U.S. Taliban peace deal? Uh, I think that uh, that is a practice, you know, Mr. Trump says something else and uh, he uh, um, call off everything just by a tweet. That is uh, a practice. But uh, you see the inertia of administration is there. They are uh, doing whatever they planned in National Security Council and cabinet meetings. Uh, Mr. Trump comes back to the same position, which is actually the administration position. That shows the strength of the American political system. 
that presidents want to change, but a president is bound by the SOPs uh, drawn by uh, the Congress, Congressional International Relations Committee and the France Committee and uh, so. So I think that uh, he now, has to have some face saving to resume that. Yeah, of and and he did. You see that uh, visit of President Trump uh, so abrupt and so secret that uh, he was uh, some other mission. He came to Washington and then uh, aircraft is standing there showing the presence of President and he took a 13 hours long visit to Afghanistan and went back. Uh, and that shows the interest of uh, Mr. Trump to resolve this issue and he personally uh, wanted to have that face saving that he came on ground, he realized that uh, he got some justification that he wanted to end up the uh, long-standing uh, presence of uh, American troops and at the same time he said that he wanted to reduce it to 8,600. That shows that Mr. President is realizing that uh, there is no other option to resume dialogue and as Mr. Sadiq and Brigadier Saab referred not times and again that there is no solution except the dialogue right. and Americans have to come to uh, agreement through negotiations. Okay. Okay. So you want to Let's not forget uh, the centuries old uh, um, parts that we playing yeah. in Afghanistan, whether mm -hmm. the Mongols or the Russians or the British or the Americans and the NATO now. Hmm. I am absolutely sure that if the Afghans are left alone to decide their fate, well, they will fight for some time, but they will find a solution. It has been proven in history when the Taliban were there in power. It was proven in history when the Shah was there. And I think even now, if the Indians do not interfere and play a sinister role in Afghanistan, Pakistan has decided that there should be peace in Afghanistan because Pakistan is much to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Of course, and, much and, to and, suffer and, if it doesn't and, happen. And the, 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 the NATO, uh, the Westerns, the Americans do not want the Afghans to, leave, uh, to be left alone. Pakistan is an open door to Central Asia through Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and Afghanistan is an open door to the sea through Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So that is, that, is, that is the stake that Afghanistan and Pakistan have. Now, if Pakistan, I think it will be, it will well be well within the favor of Pakistan if there is no interference in Afghanistan from anybody. Right. Let the Afghans find their own solution, and I can assure you they will find the solution. But right, Gidisab, and of course that's the uh, hope. I, Sana, I just yes. wanted to add, Brigadier Sahib is absolutely right, but if and buts are there, and you see whenever there would be some opportunity for intervening by the U.S., they would uh, again, and uh, because they want to protect their interests in Central Asia, and similarly, India is having a lot of stakes. If that would that corridor would be open as it was in 1993 right. uh, when Mia was in power, to, the same situation would be there because India doesn't want to have any uh, benefit for Pakistan in terms of geostrategic position. Right. I think we'll that would be problematic. We'll take a short break here and we'll come back and continue the discussion. Thank you for joining us for now. We'll take a short break and be back. Welcome back to Dialogue. We will now be talking about the situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir uh, in which the suffering of the Kashmiri people has worsened in the past 118 days. And we've seen that since the 5th of August, the lockdown still continues to remain in the Kashmir Valley and parts of uh, Jammu region. We'll talk more about this. Um, of course, we've seen that uh, so many days have passed. And initially, since the 5th of August, there was a new momentum in terms of highlighting the Kashmir issue on all sorts of uh, international forums. Uh, but now we've seen that 118 days have passed. Initially, even just 18 was a lot. Um, and this number keeps on rising. Um, so when we see um, uh, the situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir, are we just waiting for the numbers to continue rising with no change? It seems like this has become the new normal there. Yeah, I think it's new normal. And as you have said, 118 days, quite a long time. Right. And human tragedy is being unfolded there. It is being silently witnessed 
by the world, uh, by Pakistan and all other countries, the OIC, the United Nations, Security Council and everybody else. So, uh, you know, the, the gross human rights violation and the massive human rights violation that is going on in Kashmir is being silently witnessed and that is another tragedy. Exactly. Uh, the UN Security Council held its, uh, you know, meeting in, in uh, New York after 50 years, but they were unable to bring about any change there uh, on the ground. Right. And uh, the Modi government is persisting in atrocities against Kashmiris. They are being massacred, they are being, uh, you know, held uh, in incommunicado for such a long period of time. Uh, there is a communication blockade, complete lockdown and curfew. And one can imagine that what miserable life the Kashmiris are living under these circumstances. Uh, the, the, the world is only confined to passing resolutions or you know condemning these acts, but practically nothing is being done. So we need to do something more than that. I mean, some out of the box solution has to be found right. to, this, to end this situation. And I think it cannot go on for a long period of time. It has to end. And I think Pakistan, and the Islamic world can play a very important role. But unfortunately, we have seen that OIC and other Islamic countries have not been able to put its weight behind the Kashmiris, and they have not been able to put pressure on the international community to do something to end this tragedy that we have been witnessing for the last 118 days. Right, and so if uh, condemnation um, or, or um, talking about these issues or open discussions are not enough, and this is something which um, not just the UN but the OIC, like you mentioned, has also been accused for in terms of not actually giving any sort of practical um, help towards uh, ending the suffering of the Kashmiri people. When we see that the OIC's Human Rights Commission had its first ever open discussion on the worsening human rights uh, situation there and it has reiterated um, its re endorsement of the recommendation uh, of the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights for going there and to be open, uh, to have an open investigation there. Um, is this any in any way different uh, from its previous measure? It's just one of the same um, that we've seen in the past as well and has no significant value, or does it? Uh, the significance of these uh, actions is obviously doubted uh, because, uh, as Sadiqsa pointed out, there should be some concrete, uh, st some concrete steps to be taken by international community to intervene and stop these uh, human rights, serious human rights violation. But when we talk about Kashmir problem, obviously you see that uh, for the last 72 years there is only lip service from international community and sometimes it is not. Uh, but right now on the uh, efforts of responding to the efforts of Pakistan government and what Prime Minister Imran Khan spoke in the UN General Assembly and later Pakistani efforts to make world capital aware about the gravity of the situation obviously there is some movement around the world and he recently i was uh, going through the efforts doing uh, being done by the u.s congressman like senator holland he traveled through pakistan india and afghanistan he insisted on to visit uh, indian held kashmir but he was not allowed while he visited Pakistani or Pakistani part of Kashmir and uh, he was welcomed there and he found a staunch difference over there. So he is insisting American government to pass a resolution. Same is the case with Jaipal that is uh, the first uh, Indian, discard, uh, Indian discardant of uh, uh, American, Indian American uh, going in, uh, working in right now in uh, American Congress. And she is the one insisting to pass a resolution in American Congress uh, to insist India to change the human rights situation in right. Kashmir. So I think that world is moving. And uh, if people would be uh, more in that direction, uh, and I would recently mention a great uh, conference in Ankara that was participated by the uh, delegates of 26 countries. And they were all having this pledge. Uh, I was also there last week. And they pledged that they would go back to their capitals and they would con uh, conduct a seminar on the same what they have heard about. Because, you know, 
capital like Jakarta, people are not knowing the gravity of the Kashmir issue. So I think that uh, the situation is not as it is as it was previously, but what we wanted to end up the miseries of uh, Kashmiris, that is not right That's now not addressed. Right. Of course, the, the, uh, the developments that you have mentioned are mm. perhaps uh, not different than what it has been in the past. For example, the UN, UN Security Council hadn't picked up the issue in 50 years, so it's definitely a step which is different. Mm. Or the US Congress or other uh, influences all over the world, we've seen um, talking about this issue which perhaps wasn't there in the past mm -hmm. yet the on-ground situation remains the same in fact uh, since the 5th of August move it's actually worsened than what it has been exactly. in uh, the previous decades so are we really going in the right direction or is no, there something two, else that we need to do um, so now two fundamentals emerge out of it one is uh, that the BJP government and the RSS is well on their way of their agenda of cleansing the um, the Indian Union so to say from Muslims and their atrocities and state-sponsored terrorism, particularly in Kashmir and UP and other areas and Assam and Nagaland and whatnot. The other fundamental which is abundantly clear is that India is not going to be cowed down by the Security Council mm -hmm. or uh, any Western diplomatic effort or any Muslim-sponsored OIC effort. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the, the United Nations is an international body does not tell the Indians the way they should. And right. the Muslim community does not tell the Indians the way they should. Even if they do, the Indians are not going to listen. So what is going to happen? What is going to happen is that there is going to be a conflict in Kashmir, intensified. And people are going to take up arms against the Indian security forces and Indian. It is up to the Muslims of the subcontinent. I am saying subcontinent, not only India. It is up to the Muslims of the subcontinent to choose a path against the state-sponsored terrorism of India. Nothing is going to work. You have um, protest in Islamabad and across the world um, from 5th August onwards, more than 100 days. The curfew is on. The atrocities are there. People are being abducted and thousands taken across the Indian remote areas. Uh, the women are disrespected and there is a chaos and it is a human catastrophe and it is happening right next door to us. Right. So what about efforts like from international players like Turkey and Malaysia? Are they anything more concrete than the rest? Pardon me? What about efforts from players like Turkey and Malaysia? Are their efforts any more concrete than the rest? No, uh, the, or it's just the, the same? thing is that you, you, you have seen that these efforts have not uh, resulted in anything. Any fruit. Hmm. So what is the next stage in the conflict? It, it, it just cannot simmer around and the situation cannot uh, be like this forever. Uh, and, and the human history will tell you uh, that such uh, a situation leads to war. Right. Whether it is a civil war, uh, whether it is a war uh, between the interested uh, parties, the, those who want But history freedom. also teaches us that And today, today I'm telling you, Pakistan is often accused of terrorism. Pakistan is one country which has gotten rid of terrorism like no other country has done. And they, they don't want to recognize that. The Americans said two, years, uh, two, two and a half years back that they're going to have a new South Asia policy and, and they're going to hit Pakistan in a right. way that they don't. Then they realized that they, they, they are wrong and they came, on the, uh, they, they came differently to Pakistan and Donald Trump approached Imran Khan and all that stuff. But I think okay. there is a deceit. There is a deceit by the international community with regard, with regard to Palestine, with regard to Kashmir. Mm. And it is the people of those areas, Kashmir and Palestine, to choose. I think uh, my hats off to Palestinians, my hats off to Kashmiris, the way they are resisting these, these forces, uh, the, 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 the overwhelming security forces, modern military technology mm. and atrocities against us, where... Uh, the children are being killed in front of their parents. Right. The women are going to, are disrespected in front of their parents. So, I think uh, it is easier said than done, Sana. Sure. Uh, sure. It, 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 it must lead to the next phase now. Right. It is abundantly clear that it must lead to the next phase now. And the next phase is an armed struggle. Nothing else can happen. Nothing else. Is, it is the only thing, the, the, the only language that these terrorists and the BGP hooligans understand is 
the language of force against mm -hmm. them. Right, but nothing is going to change them. We hope that it uh, shouldn't come to that, and perhaps it shouldn't. It has already come uh, there to is, that. Of course, uh, no real solution through a military conflict as well. So, for the people of Kashmir, we really hope that we have we can provide an alternative. Thank you very much for joining us, ma'am and gentlemen, for being with us and talking to us regarding two very important issues, uh, which is of course the U.S. Taliban dialogue, uh, which we're hoping will revive and result in a peaceful solution for Afghanistan, in which of course the Afghan government and the intra-Afghan dialogue is also involved, and of course the end of the sufferings of the Kashmiri people, which has not only been going on for 118 days, but for the past seven decades now. And there really needs to be a turn of events. And of course, we need to make sure that whatever solution we provide is good for the people of Kashmir. Thank you for watching.